Welcome to Brindley's Mill in Leek. Brindley's Mill is a working water-powered corn mill dating back to 1752, so it's over 250 years old. It's called Brindley's Mill because it was built by James Brindley, who uh, later went on to achieve fame and fortune as a canal builder. Uh, but in his early career, he did a lot of other things, including um, mills. And he, at the time this mill was built, he was living in Leek and had a workshop in Leek. When people say mills in Leek, they tend to think of textile mills. Indeed, there's a textile mill surviving next door. But this is a flour mill. Grinds corn, all sorts of corn, to make flour. It ceased being uh, used as a flour mill sometime around about the Second World War. Stood derelict for many years. And then it was discovered in 1970s um, by someone who spotted that all the machinery was still here, who saw that it was very distinctive and it hadn't been touched very much, and so it was restored to working order about 40 years ago. The mill is a water-powered mill, as I said a moment ago, and the supply comes from the river Churnit, which has its source just a few miles upstream in the Staffordshire Moorlands, then flows through Leek and eventually joins other rivers down to the Trent and flows away into the North Sea. Here, there's enough power in the river to turn the water wheel, which I'm standing next to, and which powers the machinery inside the mill, as you will see shortly. The wheel is what we call a low breast shot wheel. That means that the water hits the wheel just below the midpoint. So it's not particularly efficient. The greater the fall of the water, the more efficient the wheel. But this is good enough to operate the machinery here. We have a, lot, a slight problem here in that the wheel is actually standing in water. That's nothing to do with the mill, it's because of later construction work further downstream. And that means that the wheel turns more slowly than it used to because it has to push the water out of the way. But it still grinds the corn um, and for demonstration purposes it's perfectly adequate. Many people comment that they can see a shadow of a building, of a roof line, above the water wheel. There obviously was a building here, and indeed there are old photographs showing a roof and a structure covering the wheel. We're not entirely sure what this was for, but probably it um, sheltered the wheel in the winter from the frost and ice. It also kept out vandals. Uh, and enabled work to be carried out on the wheel in uh, bad weather. Uh, but obviously it was not to keep it dry because once the wheel is running it will be perfectly wet all the time. The boards now are mainly oak, which last a long time. In the past elm has been used and so has larch, all perfectly acceptable as water wheel boards and those are the types of wood you'll see on water wheels around the country. So we're now starting the wheel by raising the sluice gear and immediately the water starts to fall on the wheel and just by the weight of the water falling drives the wheel round. Now this is the ground floor of the mill, which um, used to be called the meal floor because the meal, which is the, just the name of the ground flour, comes down to this floor to be bagged up when it, the grinding process is finished. Here is some meal that we've just ground a few moments ago. This is wheat, which would have been used for baking, um, but the mill also ground oats and barley for other purposes. We're just a voluntary organisation now, so we just tend to grind wheat since the grain stores better and it demonstrates the process perfectly well. Just through a hole in the wall there, you can just catch a glimpse of the water wheel that we had a look at a moment ago. When that turns on the outside of the mill, the power comes into the mill through a shaft and it drives that wheel there, that vertical wheel, which is called the pit wheel, because the bottom half of it goes down into the pit. 
Then, through these bevel gears, the power is transferred from the pit wheel to the shaft, which is called the main shaft. So that turns the main shaft, which goes up to the next floor, and drives the stones, which grind the flour. Now, the flour is ground between two circular stones. The bottom one is called the bed stone, and the top one is called the runner stone. Now, the bed stone is stationary, it never moves. And you can see the bottom of two bed stones above my head here and here. The runner stones move and the flour is ground between the two. Now, the critical thing in the grinding process is the gap between the two stones. Obviously, you're grinding a small grain of wheat, so the gap between the two stones has to be less than that. But if you close it too much and have too small a gap, the wheel will stop and the mill will literally grind to a halt. If you have it too far apart, then it won't grind at all because the grain will just sit there untouched by the runner stone. Now the miller can adjust the gap between the two stones by using this apparatus here. This is called the tentering gear. The way it works is like this. The runner stone sits on the shaft which goes up from the tentering gear. When it's running, you'll see the shaft revolve. The weight is taken on this arm, which is hinged at one end and has a screw at the other end. By turning the screw, the miller can raise or lower the runner stone. So if you're standing here and he thinks, oh, that's a little bit too coarse, he can lower the stone a little bit to bring the two stones closer together and make the grain finer grind. On the other hand, if it's going too slowly, he can open the gap a little bit to help the grinding process. So he can control the process from here. Then the flour comes down this shaft from the stones. You'll see how that happens when you go up to the next floor. It comes down the spout and is collected here. It would have been collected in sacks like this, uh, but for our purposes it's easier if we just collect it in a dustbin lid. It just makes it easier to uh, collect and to show to visitors. This apparatus here op operates the sluice gear, which is on the other side of the wall. A shaft goes through the wall and attaches to the sluice boards, which are on the top side of the water wheel. So what happens is, when I will turn this wheel, this will operate the shaft, the boards will raise, and the water will then be allowed to go through from the river onto the wheel, thereby starting the mill in uh, operation. So I'll do that now. It's quite hard work raising the sluice gear because you're pulling the boards upwards against gravity. But instantly, you'll hear the wheel start to turn. This is the middle floor of the mill, which is called the stone floor, for the obvious reason that this is where the grindstones are situated. You can't actually see them because they're cased in wood to stop the flour flying about everywhere. But um, they are here. There's two sets of working stones in this mill. When we were down on the ground floor, we saw how the power was transferred from the water wheel to the main shaft. Now, you can see here that the main shaft comes up through the floor into this uh, floor of the mill. It turns, and it turns this wheel, which is called the great spur wheel. And the power for the stones is taken off this wheel by two um, stone nuts, as they are called. They're quite simply put into and out of gear just by a simple mechanical movement. And when they're in gear, the stone nuts take the power from the great 
spur wheel, the shaft goes down and is attached to the runner stone and the runner stone turns. The grain is fed into the stones through the hoppers. Now the, this is a hopper, the grain is put into the top here and is fed down by gravity down this chute called the shoe into the eye of the stone. The grain is then ground between the stones, comes out towards the edges by centrifugal force and then drops out at the edges as flour. There's a brush that is attached to the runner stone um, that goes round and round with the runner stone so it brushes the flour around until it drops down the spout and uh, into the sacks or dustbin as you saw on the floor below. It's important to note that the cogs on the great spur wheel are metal, cast iron, whereas the ones on the stone nut are wood, usually apple or beech. The reasons for this are various. One is that it's quieter. If we had metal on metal, it would be very noisy. Secondly, if it was metal on metal, we could also get a spark, and the atmosphere in here would be combustible, so that would be extremely dangerous. And thirdly, if there's a, a sudden surge or a sudden break for some reason, what happens is that the cogs, the wooden ones, break um, and so prevent any damage to the rest of the machinery. They do wear down and have to be replaced from time to time. They're just individually made and they push in and can be pushed out again. This is one of the wooden cogs that we haven't used before it's been worn down. This one is made of beech and if one of the wooden ones broke, this would just be knocked in to replace it. You can see how the ones that are in place are quite worn, but they're still perfectly all right until such time as they break. The grain is actually agitated into the eye of the stones. It doesn't just fall by gravity, because the shoe that feeds into the eye of the stones is resting against this shaft, and so when the shaft turns, it knocks against the shoe and agitates it, shaking the grain into the stones. Now this is a set of millstones, a pair of millstones that aren't currently in use. But you can see from this that the millstones often did not come in one piece. They came in sections, were put together like this. Metal bands are put around the outside to keep them together. And then often they were plastered over with a smooth plaster surface uh, to make them more hygienic. In the inside of the stones, which you obviously can't see, the faces that meet are not flat. They are cut with grooves and it's what's called like a harp pattern on the inside of the stones. The reason for this is that it improves the grinding process. The patterns, the lines crossing each other help to cut the grain and they also provide an airflow to prevent the stones overheating when they're grinding. Here on the wall of the mill is something very interesting. There's some old writing etched into the wall, and we believe it's as follows. There's a T and an I here. Now, we know that at the time the mill was built, the land was owned by the local landowner, Thomas Jolliffe, and the I was the same as the J in those days. Then we've got a semicolon, and then 1752, which confirms other sources about the year that it was built. Then after the date, We've got another uh, colon and the letters J, B and the start of another letter which we believe was James Brindley, obviously. Unfortunately, at some later date, another window has been knocked in here, so the rest of the writing has disappeared. 
but this is additional evidence that James Brindley was involved. There's something very similar at Nether Alderley Mill at Alderley Edge. We'll now go up to the top floor of the mill, which is where the grain was stored before it was ground. This is the top floor of the mill, which is where the grain would be stored before it went to be milled. It would be fed from here into the hoppers which you saw on the stone floor below. The grain would arrive in sacks and would be brought up to this floor by mechanical means through a sack hoist. You'll see here um, the top of the sack hoist which is operated by power from the water wheel as is everything in this mill and it was raised up through the trap doors and then stored on this floor being fed, before being fed into the hoppers below. We've got a model here of a miller receiving a sack of grain through the top trap door. Unfortunately, the sack hoist mechanism doesn't work anymore. There isn't a connection with the main shaft. But just in front of my feet here is the top of the main shaft, which obviously would have revolved when the mill was in operation. And the power would have been taken off that up to the sack hoist mechanism, which is just above my head and goes up into the roof space. The power was operated by the miller on the top floor by pulling at ropes which would engage the sack hoist mechanism, raising the sacks on the ropes and then releasing them when the sacks reached this floor. It worked a bit like a clutch in that there was a loose rope or chain which didn't engage with the mechanism until the miller pulled it tight, then it engaged and operated the lifting of the sacks. We're very lucky to have at the mill uh, two items on loan of, of great historical interest relating to James Brindley. We've got one of his notebooks that he used while he was surveying his canals, and these contain measurements, other information, costs, um, all the information that he recorded when surveying his canals. The other item we've got is his level. Some people call it a theodolite, but strictly speaking it is just a level but it's similar to a primitive theodolite in that it enabled Brindley when surveying its canals to check his levels so that he could stand in one point and see quite a distance away what was at the same level which is obviously vitally important um, for planning a canal because you either had to run level or have locks to uh, move from one level to another. These are unkindly on loan from members of Brindley's family. Brindley's Mill is a remarkable survivor, really, from a bygone age, but it nearly didn't survive. Part of it has, in fact, been demolished. In 1948, about a third of the mill, which is on the side of the main road between Macclesfield and Leek, was demolished to enable the road to be widened. Fortunately for us today, that part of the mill contained storage and grain drying areas, we believe. The mechanism of the mill, the water wheel and all the grindstones and everything were of course on the side of the mill nearest to the water and have survived. It's probably survived because this small piece of land was of no use for anybody else as it is sandwiched between a textile mill and the river. It's been used for various purposes over the years as a sawmill and also for even stabling horses for a period of time in the yard. But fortunately all the mechanism in the mill has survived to, to um, be shown to visitors today. Well, that's just a tour of the main points of interest of Brindley's Mill at Leek. The mill is owned by a voluntary trust which runs the mill for the benefit of the public. We'd love you to come and visit the mill, to see the sights and sounds and smells even um, that only a visit in person can bring. If you would like to know when we're open, the best way to find out is to visit the website, which is www.brindleymill, all one word lowercase, dot net. Thank you.